Welcome to The Mushroom Show, the one place where you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. My name is Tony Shields, this is episode 31, and in this episode we're going to be looking at one of the most popular functional mushrooms in the world that is cultivated widely, but at the same time is so rare that it's illegal to pick in some places. We're also going to be looking into the wild and wacky world of well-branded but not so legal mushroom chocolates, lots happening there, and finally taking a quick tour of another functional mushroom farm, the mushroom being Tremella fusiformis, one with an incredibly unique life cycle. So if you like mushrooms, if you like the mushroom show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps the channel grow. And if you want to see future episodes of the show, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. Let's jump into the show. On to our first segment. Now, here's something that I really didn't know. Apparently, lion's mane is so rare in the UK that it's actually illegal to pick it. Considering lion's mane is one of the most popular mushrooms in the world, used daily as both a delicious gourmet mushroom and a powerful functional mushroom, I really didn't expect to see it on a list of protected species. I saw this article recently that was titled, Rare Mushroom Sighting Near Bristol Spawns Native Fungi Cloning Project, which is what put this on my radar. It talks about how rare this mushroom is in the wild, about the importance of preserving wild strains, and about the potential for cultivated strains to make their way out into the natural environment. But yes, according to the Wildlife and Countryside Act, an act intended to protect endangered plants, fungi, birds, and animals, it makes it an offense to pick, uproot, or destroy a number of mushrooms, including Heresium area. Arenaceus. The act actually refers to Heresium arenaceum, but that's neither here nor there. It's referring to the species we all know as lion's mane. And as far as I can tell, it's one of only four species of fungi that actually make the list. The other being Boletus regius, which is more correctly Butra Boletus regius, a choice edible bolete. There's also Buglossoporus pulvinus, more commonly known as the oak polypore, and Batarea phalloides, also known as the sandy stilt ball. Now, I don't know exactly what it is. The cause these four species of fungi to make it on this endangered species list. Again, especially something so lauded and widely cultivated as lion's mane. I don't think we're in danger of seeing that one go extinct anytime soon. Again, it's one of the most popular mushrooms in the world. Now, where I live in Canada, we don't actually have proper wild lion's mane, but instead have a species called Heresium coralloides, also known as the bear's tooth. It does look similar and may have similar properties, although it's hard to say. Now, one of the things that this article talks about, and something that I have quite often wondered myself, is that do wild mushrooms or wild strains or wild varieties of these cultivated mushrooms somehow have more beneficial properties, more nutrition, or are they somehow better just because they grow in the wild? The logic goes something like these mushrooms grow in the wild, so they have to put up with a lot more stresses just from the natural environment and basically everything trying trying to kill them, they have to compete a lot harder, so they might produce more compounds that might have more beneficial properties. Now, I'm sure there is some logic to the fact that what mushrooms are grown on or what substrates they grow on can definitely have some impact on the compounds that end up being inside of them. At the end of the day, especially for functional mushrooms that are to be used for supplements or functional mushrooms that are used for a specific purpose, it's the compounds inside that really matter, and these can be measured and quantified. Finally, aside from a few mushrooms like chocolate, and turkey tail which grow plentiful in the wild, in order for the most people to get the most benefit from these mushrooms, large-scale cultivation really is the best way to go. Think about cordyceps for example. Before it was discovered that you could grow cordyceps militaris without bugs, the way to get cordyceps was to use cordyceps sinensis that was harvested from the wild. It was ridiculously expensive and not at all feasible to be used as a regular supplement. But is cultivated cordyceps militaris somehow subpar? Not at all. It actually has really high levels of fungal beta-glucan and cordycepin, which are the two compounds in this mushroom that make it so powerful. Still though, I do think this is a really interesting idea. I think of course that mushroom habitats should be carefully looked after and people should continuously look to nature to find novel strains, not only because it's cool, but because it might lead to finding natural variants of a certain mushroom with interesting properties that can then be cultivated so that more people can benefit from it, whether using it for a food or as a mushroom supplement. Now another interesting thing to think about is the complete opposite of this idea. What happens when cultivated strains leak out of the farm and start to establish themselves in environments where they're not necessarily supposed to be? As mushroom farming gets more popular, you are starting to see a lot more of this. For example, wild shiitake now grows in many places in the US. This is a clear example of mushrooms leaking out from the farm. And also yellow oysters are popping up in plenty of places all over the world really. They 
seem to be one of the most adaptable to non-native environments. So is this a problem? Is it time to call certain mushrooms an invasive species? It's hard to say. I mean, I obviously want to say no because I love mushrooms and I want to see them growing out in the wild and I want to see all sorts of varieties out in the wild. And also, it's not like this is a new concept. Like mushrooms have been spreading around for quite a long time. Mushroom spores are everywhere and can travel on humans, on birds, on animals, and maybe even through space. I could see it being a major issue if these invasive mushrooms were somehow destroying habitats or somehow messing up the ecology in some other way. But yellow oysters, for example, they just feed off of dead matter. They produce these beautiful yellow bouquets of mushrooms that are actually edible. I don't really see that being a problem. If a consequence of mushroom farming becoming more popular is having a proliferation of oyster, lion's mane, and shiitake in our forest, it's hard to complain about that. Especially, as we mentioned at the top of the segment, with something like lion's mane that is considered an endangered species in some places. At the end of the day, I do think we'd be in a worse spot if these mushrooms weren't cultivated for some reason. So every once in a while, maybe yellow oysters or lion's mane leaks out and starts growing in a compost pile outside or in the forest, but it doesn't seem to be something that isn't manageable currently and the benefit is that we get to grow these mushrooms. But I would like to know what you think of all of this. Let me know in the comments. Number one, what do you think about wild mushrooms, wild functional mushrooms, and are they different from cultivated mushrooms? And what do you think about cultivated mushrooms maybe escaping out into the wild? This episode of The Mushroom Show is brought to you by Fresh Cat Mushrooms, pure and powerful mushroom supplements to help you achieve your health goals. We are already well into 2024, believe it or not, and now might be the time to do a quick check-in on your new year's resolutions. And if you haven't said any yet, it's not too late. Either way, whenever you're ready to fuel your well-being with the power of mushrooms, Fresh Cap is here for you. With pure and powerful mushroom extracts and powders made from whole mushroom fruiting body, thoroughly extracted and tested for active compounds, Fresh Cap is your number one choice for quality mushrooms. Choose from top functional mushrooms like lion's mane or turkey tail, or check out the ultimate mushroom complex, which is a blend of six popular functional mushrooms, including lion's mane, cordyceps, chaga, turkey tail, maitake, and reishi, available in both powder and capsule form. To get yours, head over to freshcap.com or search for Freshcap on Amazon. Let's get back to the show. On to our next segment. Now, aside from a few edge cases in Oregon, in Oakland, and in Denver, Colorado, psilocybin mushrooms are still illegal in the U.S. And although it seems like the laws and regulations surrounding psilocybin are being enforced less and less, according to a recently published study, seizures of psilocybin mushrooms have actually been going up in the last few years. The study is titled National and Regional Trends in Seizures of Shrooms, psilocybin, in the United States between 2017 and 2022. And looking at the study, they found that there were 402 police seizures of psilocybin mushrooms, totaling 226 kilograms in 2017 compared to a whopping 1,396 seizures totaling 844 kilograms in 2022. That is a 350% increase in the number of law enforcement seizures of psilocybin mushrooms in only five years. Now, a lot of this probably has to do with an increase in popularity and prevalence of these mushrooms rather than just an increase in the level of enforcement. But either way, if you looked at some of the products being sold both online and in head shops and in different underground stores, you wouldn't know it. That's because well-branded, slick-looking mushroom products are becoming more and more prevalent. I came across this article about mushroom chocolates in Bon Appetit, of all places, titled Inside the Luxurious World of Illegal Magic Mushroom Chocolate. And it basically has the same sentiment that these products wouldn't look out of place in an Erewhon or any other grocery store, except for the fact that you probably won't see See them there anytime soon. I saw this myself not in the US but in Jamaica where it is legal and there are some companies there that are starting to produce some well-branded high quality mushroom chocolate products. And just like the title of this article suggests these things were very luxurious. They came in a beautiful gold box they obviously looked really high quality but not necessarily cheap either. I believe these bars were around $70 each. Now before talking about the implications of this I think it makes sense to talk about why these are proliferating in the first place. The obvious reason is that, hey, maybe people just want to eat something that's delicious rather than trying to scarf down some kind of wrinkly, dried up organic matter. But that can also be achieved through mushroom capsules, which is something that you see being used in clinical trials. Another reason would be, hey, maybe if it's evenly distributed, it might be easier to get an accurate dose and you don't have to mess around with a bunch of dried organic matter on a scale. But is there another reason why mushroom 
mushrooms and chocolate seem to go together so well. Believe it or not, there is some historical context for this that dates back to ancient Mesoamerican cultures, including the Aztecs and the Maya, who were known for using both chocolate, which was used for strength and vitality, and psilocybin containing mushrooms, which were known as the flesh of the gods for spiritual and ceremonial purposes. Some have suggested that these two were taken together in order to enhance the effects of both substances. There are a couple of theories as to why this might be the case. One is that the fat from the chocolate might help with the absorption of psilocybin. It's speculated that the lipid content in chocolate could potentially assist in increasing the solubility of psilocybin's active metabolite, psilocin, thereby enhancing its bioavailability and make it more efficient in crossing the blood-brain barrier. The other is that chocolate actually might contain some compounds that are of interest in relation to mood and brain function. One of the components of chocolate is theobromine, which is a mild stimulant and has some similarities to caffeine, though it is less potent. Psilocybin obviously has effects on mood as well, so you can see how taken together it could have some notable effects. Chocolate also contains phenylthylamine, which apparently causes our brains to release dopamine, which is the feel-good neurotransmitter. But the other likely reason why these might have been taken together historically is because of the presence of MAO inhibitors in chocolate, which stands for monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Monoamine oxidase enzymes are responsible for breaking down neurotransmitters such as serotonin in the brain. Psilocybin, as many of you know, acts on the serotonin receptors. If chocolate acts to inhibit MAO enzymes, even slightly, it could potentially lead to increased levels of psilocin in the brain by slowing its breakdown. In theory, this could alter the effect of the mushrooms by either making the effects come on stronger or making the effects last longer. Now a lot of the apparent synergies between mushrooms and chocolate are anecdotal but there is some scientific and historical context so it will be pretty interesting to see if these become more prevalent and if these become legal if we can get some more kind of conclusive data or conclusive ideas on how this actually works. But back to the US at the current time. You see on one hand these are becoming more prevalent and on the other hand you realize they are still illegal. So does that pose some potential risks? Another risk that was brought up in the article that I thought was really interesting actually was the potential for counterfeits. So sure, you might have these brands that are making really high quality products that are testing everything properly, that are doing everything above board, except for the fact that it's not legal. But then you might have a counterfeit product that looks exactly the same, but might not be up to the same standard of quality. And there's really no recourse because both of the products are illegal. This risk obviously exists for basically any product, but it seems to be a little more important here because of the underground nature of the products. Again, this is really a moving target. It's something that is changing all the time. And I've said this many times before, but I'm sure five years from now, 10 years from now, it's all gonna look totally different. And perhaps some of the brands that are doing this now are just kind of setting themselves up for the inevitable, in their mind, legality of these products in, in the US and beyond. Either way, it'll be pretty interesting to follow as it continues to unfold. On to our next story. Now, a few episodes ago, we went on a quick virtual tour of of two different mushroom farms. One was a reishi mushroom farm and another was a cordyceps mushroom farm. But there's another functional mushroom that doesn't get near as much attention even though it is super powerful and it is super interesting in how it grows. That mushroom is known as Tremella fusiformis, more commonly called just Tremella. I thought it would be fun to do another similar virtual tour of a Tremella farm so you can get an idea of what it looks like when it grows. Now Tremella has quite the history, often used for skin health and no known as the beauty mushroom, but it also has some interesting compounds that make it a candidate to stand up against lion's mane as a brain mushroom. Also similarly to lion's mane, Tremella is both a powerful functional mushroom and a delicious gourmet mushroom. Although being a jelly fungus, the texture is definitely not for everybody. I have tried Tremella in a variety of ways. One of them was in a drink. You can get like a drink that has a floating Tremella inside of it. I would just say it was interesting. It wasn't necessarily great. I don't know if I'd get it again, but the texture was just kind of a little bit weird, but obviously there's some people that really like it. But what's really interesting to me about Tremella is not how it tastes or necessarily what it looks like, but how it grows. You see, Tremella is known as a mycoparasite, meaning that in order to grow properly, it needs to feast on other fungi. 
And for the longest time, this mushroom was harvested from the wild. It was highly revered because of all these wonderful properties that it has, but nobody really knew how to grow it because they were missing out on this really key piece of information, the fact that it's a mycoparasite. So here's how it's done now. Synthetic logs, which are basically made of hardwood sawdust and some other valuable nutrients, are sterilized and inoculated first with a host fungus, usually a mushroom, and this is a mouthful, it's called Anulohypoxylon archeri, which is itself a saprophytic fungus, meaning it can happily just eat the wood-based substrate and grow. But once that first mushroom takes over the substrate, then the tremella mushroom is introduced, which feasts on the substrate and on the host mushroom. Once the logs are fully colonized and ready to fruit, they're placed in fruiting conditions, which don't have to be all that fancy. This one was simply a shade house lined in dark plastic to maintain humidity and prevent direct sunlight, and also covered in reeds for insulation and probably to maintain a reasonably stable temperature while they were fruiting. Inside, the shelves are just made of wood and bamboo. This particular farm was growing them in midsummer, which believe it or not is not ideal for tremella, but just look at the results. Either way, you can see how amazing it can turn out. When the tremella fruits, it is absolutely stunning. It forms these perfect loofah-shaped mushrooms, almost all look too good to be true. Each one of these fruiting logs had three perfectly shaped mushrooms just about ready for harvest. After the mushrooms are harvested, they are usually dried. Here's an example of a dried tremella fruiting body right here. It's really light. Again, you can see it looks like that loofah kind of variety, and it's really like flaky and sharp and it kind of just breaks apart really easily. It needs to be rehydrated if you wanted to eat it as a gourmet mushroom, but what's typically done, since it's quite often used as a functional mushroom, is this would be ground up, it's then extracted, and then it would be spray dried back into a powder that can be added to capsules or you'd use as a functional mushroom powder or maybe even added to other kind of value added mushroom products. This was another example, at least for me, of something that looks really easy, but is actually really hard. Like you see these big, beautiful tremella mushrooms growing everywhere, looks pretty easy, but it takes a lot of knowledge. It took somebody to figure out that it was a mycoparasite and that you have to first inoculate the log with the hypoxylon species, all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you have these big, beautiful mushrooms that are growing abundantly. Very similar to Cordyceps militaris that we looked at last time. You see these big buckets of beautiful Cordyceps militaris mushrooms. Looks easy, but it's actually really hard to do. And uh, I always just love seeing these farms. So, so far we've done a reishi farm, a Cordyceps farm, and now a Tromella farm. And and if there's any other species that you'd like to see, let me know and we'll see if we could put that together. But that's it for this episode of The Mushroom Show. Again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching. If you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really does help the channel grow. And if you wanna see future episodes of The Mushroom Show, go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. At the time of recording, we're just about at 500,000 subscribers, which is absolutely wild. So if you're watching this and we're still under 500,000 subscribers and you wanna get in before we get there, now's the time. So again, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.